Welcome, welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I know that people are still coming in. My name is Susan, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar worship service. Um, I see that a number of people are still coming in. Thanks so much. We're trying this webinar um, mode of doing the uh, worship service and let me know um, how it is for you. I want to encourage you as we enter into um, the service today that we're going to want to you to use the chat and um, I would uh, love to introduce everyone who's going to be in the service. Suzanne, wave Suzanne. Hi everybody. And, and James and uh, the Samsons. Mike Davis who will be speaking. And um, yeah, so I'm going to turn it over to the Samsons now who will open up our service in scripture and in prayer. We unmute. <laughs> Good morning. This is Russ. I'm Jennifer. We are the Samsons. And um, over to Russ. Today's scripture reading will be from Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8 from the New Living Translation. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God was something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Okay, let's pray. Dear sweet Jesus, thank you for doing all of that for us. Thank you for being the ultimate model of service, kindness, generosity, obedience to God. This morning, would you please show us where we are grasping and clinging to meet our own needs instead of laying them at the foot of the cross? and trusting you to attend to them as you always do. God, help us to notice where you are filling us up so that we can respond to your call to be generous with our lives. Guide the eyes of our hearts to see hope, joy, peace, and love that spring from you and that are cultivated in us by your Holy Spirit for us to go and bless the world. Jesus, show us today that with you by our side, enough has been given. We pray now for our service this morning and ask that you would bless all those who speak and bless all those who listen. In your name, Jesus, amen. And now Suzanne and Terrence will lead us in worship. Hey. Actually, it's just me right now. <laughs> Terrence will join us in a little bit. So good to be with you all through webinar this morning. And we just want to worship God in spirit and in truth. So let's take a deep breath. And just release everything that just gets in the way from our focus on Jesus. How 
how beautiful you are, God, for all that you have done and all that you continue to do. We thank you, Lord. Let's worship him.
you are above it all. Lord, we thank you that you are truly above it all, God. You are truly above it all, God. There is nothing that you don't see. There is nothing that you can't handle. There's nothing too big or too small. And Lord, we confess there are times when we doubt, when we let stress and anxiety get the best of us. But we thank you, God, that even in our weakness, you, you work through it. And then it becomes a strength. And that is only by that miracle of you, God. Because only you can do something like that, God. Show me how much you love humility. Oh, Spirit, be the star that leads me to this humble heart.
Thank you, God, that you are the God of the broken. That you are a friend of the weak. That you want to refresh those who are weary, to embrace those who are in need. So help us, God, to be like you. Help us, God, to have this heart that you have. Teach us, Lord, what it means to be humble. And take the broken pieces of our life and make them like new, God. And only the way that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. And next we'll have announcements with James. Welcome. If you're new to our community, we're so happy to have you and um, glad you joined. If you'd like to find out more about the Vineyard, uh, please fill out this form so we can follow up with you. It's at bit.ly slash PAVC on you. We will put this web address in the chat window and as a thank you for checking out our church, we will send you a welcome card. My name is James Chan and I'll be your host for today. And uh, I will admit that I, I miss being in church and I miss seeing all of your faces. I miss the chance to make a little eye contact and smile and, and so I think the best we can do today is to simulate that by actively using the, the chat function in this webinar. So please be liberal about that. Um, if you've got a, even the inkling of a little thought to chat with someone or send a little message, please do that. It's a, it'll be a real blessing. And now I'd like to highlight a few things going on in the life of our church. First, small groups. I think many of you realize that the best way to grow in your life with Jesus in our church is to stay connected. And that's especially true in this isolating season of COVID. And the best way to stay connected in this case is to be in a small group. Now, small groups are going to restart and be updated for the fall. And so please visit the church website if you're interested. Um, there's lots of information. And please check them out soon because most small groups will be starting up in a few weeks. And if you'd like to help, you like some help figuring out which small group may be best for you, Pastor Susan or Pastor Ron would love to help you out. Just reach out to them by email. Or if you're feeling really moved right now, you can go to the chat session and click on their names and say, hey, Ron, I really would love to find a small group to be part of because I'm feeling a little lonely or I'd like to connect with someone or a group of folks. We've got another new way of helping people connect and we're calling them quad pods. These are groups of four men or women who want to meet in person every one or two weeks just to connect as people to share how you're doing and and to pray for one another if you're interested please fill out the form there should be a link in the chat session and if you know anyone else who might benefit from something like this please invite them to consider signing up i think we're all right now trying to find ways to connect and ways to sort of um, stay connected. And I think these things, these sort of new techniques are going to be really, really important. And so please think about it. And if you're feeling moved, reach out. Finally, kids and youth. We've got a program called Kids for Kids and Youth for Youth. Children, youth, and parents are invited to a special start of the new school year. Uh, if, you're, if you're sort of um, if you're someone without kids, you might not have noticed this, but if you've got kids or you've got kids around, you've definitely noticed this, that school is starting. And so we'd love to do something for kids to bless other kids. And so on Saturday, September 5th, we will be putting together hygiene kits at the church office, especially for children and youth in our community who can use the assistance. After working together to bless others, kids and youth will have the opportunity to be blessed by praying for people and for themselves and for their classmates as they start their new school year. Members from the team will be present to pray, from the prayer team will be present to pray for children and youth. And um, please sign up if you're interested on the link in the chat. And if you're thinking about it again, just 
send me a little note if you're wondering whether or not you should do this. My bet is yes, and my bet is that it'll be a deep, deep blessing. Finally, offering. We're gonna take a minute now to make space for offering. This is our chance as a body to give back. And even in times of stress to say that we acknowledge that all of the ways that we're provided for come from Jesus and also to acknowledge the important work of this church. Now, many of us give online either through a mail check from your bank or via Tithely, our online church platform. You can also text the word give, G-I-V-E, to this number, 669-236-2940. If you choose to give by check, please send it to our church office. We will put the phone number and the church office address in the chat window for your convenience. And now before I pray for the offering today, I'd like to pray for everyone in our area who has had to evacuate due to the wildfires and especially for our brothers and sisters who attend the Scotts Valley Vineyard Church, which meets up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I think when you saw those slides for worship and you saw those blue skies, I think I was just reminded of how the promise of clear air and how precious that is and how often we take it for granted. A number of folks in our church have had to evacuate their homes due to the wildfires, and some have had to relocate several times. And one family has completely lost their home to fires. And so will you pray with me now for both the offering and for those who've been affected by the fires? God, even amidst all of this fear and stress, you continue to provide and support. I ask that you be with Pastor Emmett Blue and his wife, Stacy. I pray that you give them just extra resources and your Holy Spirit to support each other, to receive support and be able to love their neighbors at this time. I pray for all of those who had to evacuate now. And I ask that you give them your heart and that you provide your love. And God, I ask that you take this offering now that you would allow us to be generous and give in this time of dealing with this epidemic and that you bless this that we are now offering up to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Terrific. Well, it is so good to see the, the chat sessions stroll by. I'm looking forward to engaging with folks throughout the service and you're all in for a special treat, uh, which will soon be revealed. God bless everyone. Hi everyone, um, just wanted to say hello again. My name is Susan Van Reason, for those of you who weren't here at the very beginning. And this is our opportunity to say hello to each other. There's some of us who are panelists who are on the screen, but um, let me give you a chat question so that we can hear from everyone. Last week, Ron asked us, what are you grateful for? And um, I'm gonna ask you, who are you grateful for? Hmm. So it could be someone in our church, could be someone in your life, could be a random person, but uh, who's on your heart that you feel like, thank you, God, I'm grateful for so-and-so. So go ahead and put that in the chat. Aw. Ron is grateful for Ann Hosey, who just got her PhD. Woohoo! Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Many people are grateful for Mike Davis, because maybe because they know he's going to come and speak in a few minutes. People are grateful for uh, their family members, dogs. Dogs are a who, yes. All right, you're welcome to keep doing that, and um, we'll rejoice 
with you in all the different people that you're grateful for. I think it's good to enter into the discipline of gratitude together. Um, but I'm going to move us into a time of receiving the teaching. And um, Mike Davis, for those of you who don't know him, has been a, a member of our church for a long time. And he has been a minister of the gospel for a very long time as well. He loves God, he loves people. He's been serving as a leader and a member and a small group leader of our church uh, for a good number of years now. Uh, would you join me as I pray for Mike? Lord, I pray that you'd set your hand upon our brother Mike, that he would share his heart and his conviction from the scripture. Help him, Lord, to give of himself as an act of faith and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mike Davis, take it away. All right. Good morning. Uh, I am Mike Davis. Um, as Susan mentioned, I've been attending here for at least four years, if I remember correctly. Gray hair, we don't know. Um, I am a small group leader, a small group shepherd, uh, a spiritual mentor here at the Palo Alto Vineyard. And um, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but, you know, I don't always give the message Sunday morning. But when I do, I prefer dos espresso with the tea bag and a little bit of your finest Colombian coffee so that I can have just the right boldness and flavor to keep things in Terra Sante. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, okay. Apparently I've been told to update my resume. I apologize. Um, seriously though, it's, that's probably the most lighthearted thing you're gonna hear today. Uh, we are currently doing a series called God and Film. And it is a series that we've done over the years. And this year was decided to focus on films dealing with a topic that you may have heard about recently, race. Uh, Pastor Susan reviewed the, the movie Just Mercy last week, which was a story of an African-American man falsely convicted of a crime he did not commit and his eventual exoneration. This week, we'll be looking at the movie Selma, which uh, portrays events that take place in the city of Selma, Al Alabama, um, this was in the midst of what has come to be known as the, the civil rights movement. Uh, the civil rights movement because though there had been others, none had accomplished as much for the advancement of equality for people of color. It takes place in 1965. Um, I know it's hard to believe, but I was 10 years old then. At that time, there were four white families in my neighborhood. Not one was left by the time I hit high school. And the reason for that is because this was also the height of what was termed white flight to the suburbs. White flight to the suburbs was that as African Americans were uh, financially more able to buy homes and politically allowed to purchase homes, as they integrated neighborhoods, white families ran for the hills. Those were the times that the events of this movie take place. In the movie, we have protesters led by Dr. Martin Luther King coming to Selma to demand the right to vote. <coughs> Excuse me. Forgive me, there we go. Um, yeah, see, they were there to demand the right to vote for African-Americans. They were called Negroes back then. Um, and technically, they already had that right. Uh, technically, legally, they were allowed to vote. But particularly in the South, they were continually and effectively denied that right. So the protesters came to the city. Many weren't from there. But they stood in unison with those who did live there. And what they did was they would come and they had a plan and they had a process that they had used elsewhere. Um, in Albany, which is a city 
near where my paternal grandfather was a sharecropper, they came and they protested. In Montgomery, where high pressure fire hoses were turned on peaceful protesters. And later they would turn to Memphis where Dr. King would be murdered by an assassin's bullet. So this movie, it is a movie, it's a dramatized account. And though it's a dramatized account, it's an actual historical event. This really took place. You have to keep in mind that this isn't the latest Avengers movie where the action and the violence is manufactured and amped up with CGI and no one ever really dies. This is a snapshot or a screen clip of one event and only one event of a tragic story in the midst of an unimaginable healing process that spans the ages. What I need you to understand though, is that it's not the past, it's not new as in fresh on the scene. It's not unique and it's not over. I'm gonna say that again. It's not the past. It's not new as in fresh on the scene. It's not unique and it's not over. Let's watch the clip. You have two minutes. Stand right there. We're ready. This is an unlawful assembly. You have two minutes to disperse. Go home or go to your church. This march will not continue. Two minutes. May I have a word with the Major? There's no word to be had. Major Clown, may we speak with you? were swept to the ground, screaming, arms and legs flying, packs and bags went skittering across the grassy divider. <laughs> Those still on their feet retreated. A cheer went up from the white spectators lining the south side of the highway. of victims suffering fractures of ribs, heads, arms, legs. The Negro leader, John Lewis, despite injury from a possible skull fracture, led the marchers back to the chapel after the encounter with officers. He said, I don't see how President Johnson can send troops to Vietnam and can't send troops to Selma, Alabama, to which the Negroes present rolled her their approval. With my mother, please walk me, Lord. You walked with my mother. Thank you. 
I want you to just sit with that for a moment because our tendency is always to look away, to deflect and to minimize. I'm going to ask that you not do that this morning. Let's just agree that for these few seconds that we will sit with the tension, that we will sit with the dreadfulness of what we've just seen. As you contemplate that, as you replay that in your mind, what thoughts and emotions come up for you? I'd like you to put those in the chat. Mm. Anger, frustration, horror, revulsion, gut punch, grief, yeah, all that. All those are good, and I obviously I, I have some thoughts on the subject, um, but before I get into that, I want to acknowledge to you that this is a difficult message for me to give. Um, Clearly the subject matter is tough to deal with, um, but then there's also the issues of how hard and how deep do you go in on any given point. Um, and not only that, uh, I'm relying on facts that some people consider to be controversial. And I'm convinced that white or black, left or right, there's something here that's probably going to upset everyone. Let's pray. So Lord, we've already bathed this in prayer, but we, we come to you again um, because content like this brings up deep emotions. Um, and so Lord, we pray that uh, as we experience those emotions, and I pray Lord that we would, that we would actually experience those emotions, but that as we do, Lord, that by your spirit, uh, you would bring clarity of thought that you would bring um, recognition of truth um, and that you would bring us the ability to change for the better. And we just call this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in this clip, I see three groups clashing. We have the protesters. That's Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, Diane Nash, Amelia Boynton, and others who come to Selma to register African Americans to vote. We have the white residents of Selma, otherwise good Christian men and women who stood on the side and cheered as their fellow citizens were tear gassed and beaten senseless with clothes. Not just them, we have other white Americans across the country, many who would affirm their faith in God, who stood silent and did nothing as they heard people cry out for justice. And then we have the men and women of color who are now pressed to the limit and deciding that, you know what, enough is enough, no more. And they are prepared to resort to the same type of violence that has been perpetrated on them. 
it would be easy to say, yeah, but that was 1965, Mike. But I'm here to tell you, this is not the world as it was. This is the world as it is. Have there been changes? Absolutely. But as someone just said to me the other day, Mike is still the same circus. It's just with different clowns. That was 1965, but it is 2020 when protests break out nationwide in the aftermath of the killing of Ahmad Arbery, shot in the street for being black while jogging. And then eight weeks later, we have the killing of George Floyd by a police officer as he lay on the ground, handcuffed, gasping for air. Protests mount as people of all races demand equal justice for the victims of racism and police brutality. Yes, it was 1965, but it's 2016 when a professional football player decides to kneel during the playing of the national anthem in protest of another senseless killing of an African-American by police. White America is more upset that a black athlete is supposedly dishonoring the flag than the loss of lives that caused him to challenge it. A professional basketball player who supports the move is told by white America to, hey, just dribble the ball. Because according to white America, his only role is to entertain them. Beyond that, nothing needs to change. That was 1965, but it's 2020 when a white teen with an assault rifle clearly visible walks by and even talks with the police before shooting, two, shooting and killing two protesters and wounding another. He's arrested without incident. The, the protest was in response to the shooting of an unarmed black man by police in front of his children. Think about that for a moment. I know Julie sent the clip out to all you parents. Some of you probably decided not to let your children watch this clip for fear that the violence portrayed there might traumatize them. How traumatized do you think those that man's kids are right now. So the first thing I want us to see is that again, this is not the past, it is the present. And sadly, to some degree, it's our future. Evil is hard to tear down and it's even harder to modify and reform. We have to win another way. The next thing is we have to recognize that this is the world that we live in. And when I say we, I don't mean just me or just people of color. This is the world we all reside in. And even though it's the second point, it's possibly the more important point because it has to be accepted if we're actually to make any progress. Without getting too far off track, let me just say, that there are systems in place that allow some of us to be unaware of such a reality. There are systems that exist that intentionally aggregate some and separate others, such that the two experience life completely different. And this in turn allows some to be unaware and to be apathetic to the plight of others because in their world, such things just don't happen. If those things are happening elsewhere over there, it has to be because what would be unimaginable in the preferred sphere had to have taken place over there. This idea of separation and otherness prohibits our ability to come together in meaningful ways. We have to win another way. 
to paraphrase Dr. Willie James Jennings, he's a theology professor at Yale Divinity School and has done some work around the origins of race. He says that we need a spiritual practice that counteracts our racial practice and anchors our political work and our vision of the church. Now, I'm gonna repeat that a couple of times because it's very important. We need a spiritual practice that counteracts our racial practice and anchors our political work and our vision of the church. Once more, because I know it's hard to write. <laughs> we need a spiritual practice that counteracts our racial practice and anchors our political work and our vision of the church. The spiritual practice comes first. It's the spiritual practice that counteracts our racial bias, our racial narratives, and it anchors our political work and activity that actually seeks justice rather than exclusion or retribution. And it keeps the church focused on what its true calling is, that of representing God in his kingdom on earth. So that starts, though, with repentance of our idolatry. And I know somebody's going, idolatry, where did that come from? Yes, our idolatry, idolatry. Idolatry is a worship of something other than God. It is the giving of our will and our affections over to something other than God. And in this case, it's the worship of self, it's the worship of national pride, and it's the worship of exceptionalism. See, we serve a God, a creator God, whose aim in history is the formation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with himself at the very center as his prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. An all-inclusive community. It's a community that, wait for it, is not culturally white. Jesus isn't fair-haired and blue-eyed as he's often portrayed in art and literature. It's a community that, guess what? It's not culturally black. And Jesus, though undoubtedly dark-skinned, was not a black man, as some have imagined, in protest to their white counterparts. We need to understand that we as Americans, black, white, or otherwise, are Gentiles. Gentiles. Mike, what is a Gentile? In simple terms, a Gentile is anyone who's not a Jew. If you are not a part of the people of the book by blood and by spiritual practice, you are a Gentile. We are not the chosen people. We are people who have been accepted by the God of another people. Look with me on Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the, in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one. What two groups? Jews and everybody else. He has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. What two? Again, Jews and everybody else. Thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both 
of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and he preached peace. Peace to those, oops, forgive me. Peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Huge point, God is building an all-inclusive community. That all-inclusive community involves everyone, right? It starts with the Jews, the Gentiles, which is everybody else, is grafted into that. And we are allowed to receive salvation through Christ. That's important because what it means is we don't get to exclude ourselves from Jews, indigenous people, Africans, Italians, Russians, Muslims. We don't get to exclude because God has made it so that there is an all-inclusive community that we all become one. So last week, Pastor Susan referenced Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, o mortal what is good and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So in that verse, we are told that one of the requirements is to walk humbly with your God. So in the context of what I just described, this making of an all-inclusive community, what do you think it would look like to walk humbly with God? And again, I'm going to ask you to put your responses in the chat area. What would it look like to walk humbly with your God in the concept of making an all-inclusive community? Acceptance for all, a learning posture, very good. Our view is not always the right view, very good. Ooh, to interrogate our own racial biases. Have you guys been reading my message? Laying down my preconceptions. Always ready to repent and apologize on a dime. You know what? I think I'm just going to go home. You guys already know the message. Those are great. Those are directly on point because my takeaway is that one way to work, uh, to walk humbly with God in this context is to work towards unity and the embracing of the other. The corollary to that would be that any attempts at separation and exaltation above others would be contrary to that. We have to win another way. So what do we do? What are we to actually do in the words of Francis Schaeffer, a theologian from way back when, how then should we live? We live the way of the gospel. So what is the way of the gospel? The way of the gospel is to, like Jesus, and even like Dr. King and his followers that protested, we must enter into the discomfort and address the needs of those around us. Enter into the discomfort and address the needs of those around us. And not from afar, but incarnationally, shoulder to shoulder, to the degree that we can. Look at Philippians chapter two, verses three and eight through eight. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Importantly, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. 
in your relationship with one another have the same mindset as Christ, who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So this idea that we can clamor for place, that we can clamor for protection of place, that's not the way of the gospel. That's not the way of Jesus. We win by refusing to place ourselves above the other, be it in our actions or even in our attitude. Overt actions are obvious, but attitudes of superiority and attitudes of self-loathing are equal opportunity builders and sustainers of walls. In the movie, Dr. King says that they had a process and it was simple. They would go to a place, they would negotiate, they would demonstrate, they would resist. Our process is different, but equally simple. Simple, excuse me. Having entered into the discomfort, we like Jesus, teach, preach, proclaim, and demonstrate the kingdom of God. By that, I mean we come alongside people where they are and as they are. Our role is to live out the principles of the kingdom what I mean by that is as opportunities arise, we teach, we preach, we proclaim, or we demonstrate. And that requires guidance from the Holy Spirit to determine which and when that we do those. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. In Jesus' day, it was thought that freedom from Rome was the main thing, but it wasn't. In our day, some feel that making America great again is the main thing. Others that it's about social justice, they are not. The main thing is the formation of an all-inclusive community of loving persons with God himself at the very center at its, as its prime sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. So how does that work in real life? Um, I have a couple of examples. Um, where I, um, I just realized I have too many jobs. Um, one of the jobs I have is as a fitness trainer. And at the facility that I train out of, um, there is a homeless guy who every morning, like clockwork, walks by. He does a route where he goes to certain dumpsters and gets things, packs them up in his cart, and disappears several blocks over where he trades them in for money or something. And uh, someone at the facility had kind of said a um, degrading remark about him. And um, after taking issue with that, I, I decided that I needed to do more than that. I needed to, you know, I need to see what this guy's story is. Um, so I invited this guy to go have coffee. And so for several weeks, we would meet once a week and we would have coffee and he'd try to figure out what my deal was because he really didn't trust, <laughs> you know, I, why, why do you want to talk with me? And, and so all I wanted to do was establish being a friend for him. And if I could help him, fine, but the real deal was to be a friend for him. That's one way. Um, I have a client whose brother had died um, and obviously he was heartbroken and uh, but he was talking about issues of faith and about his family and his brother. And frankly, I just told him outright. I said, you know, I'm not convinced that you have the same understanding of salvation that your brother and the rest of your family does. And he thought and he said, well, what do I do? <laughs> so again, with him, we sat. Um, once a week for several weeks, and we read the Bible. And we talked about where what he thought the Bible was saying was actually saying something different. That's one way. 
Another way was I was talking with um, Cassie and uh, John yesterday, Cassie Dancer and John White, and they were part of the prayer vigil that took place on Thursday. And I was asking how that went, and they were talking about how, you know, the uh, staff um, at, uh, at, I just lost the name, Bay Ministries, um, the staff and the children that were prayed for were just amazed at the depth and the perception of the prayer that they received, right? That's stepping into the discomfort, right? That's proclaiming, that's demonstrating the kingdom. So as we engage people, wherever we happen to be, and, I, and trust me, I know this is hard. Um, our task is not to get people to change. Our task is not to get people to change. I know it's counterintuitive, but if you look at Jesus, if you look at how Jesus did his discipleship process, he never, ever told people to get their act together and then follow him. Never. He witnessed to the truth and he let the spirit do the rest. And that's what we should do. So when we run into that person who's convinced that white makes right, or that person who is convinced that every act against a person of color is racially motivated, we witness to the truth. We don't berate, we don't take arms, but as the spirit leads, we teach, we preach, proclaim, and demonstrate the kingdom. Finally, Pastor Susan mentioned last week that justice is a requirement. So we're back to Micah 6, right? <clears throat> we actually are required to act justly. We are to love mercy. We are to walk humbly. Why? Because that is how we actually allow for the formation of the type of community God designs. So as we enter into those places of discomfort, we ask ourselves questions. We ask questions like, what do we assume is being right? What do we assume as that all is as it should be that actually hinders or thwarts the flourishing of another? And how can we address that? Is it right or okay that persons of color pay higher interest rate on loans than other people. I just saw the other day, is it okay, is it right that um, appraisals of homes owned by African Americans or people of color are routinely discounted 23% on average? Is that okay, is that right? And more importantly, how do we address that? So we don't ignore it, we address it. Secondly, big one, who are we avoiding being drawn to? And in what ways are we resisting the spirit of God's desire to join us? Ooh. Who are we avoiding being drawn to and how are we resisting the spirit of God's desire to join us? Who is that person that God put that little tickle in your ear that says, you know, you should go, you should go say hello to George. You should get to know George. But he's a uh, fill in the blank. I know, but I still love him. How are we humbly seeking out? How are we understanding? And how are we testifying to truth that unifies versus truth that separates? How are we seeking out understanding and testifying to truth that unifies, unifies versus um, truth that separates? And so that's a toughie because what that means is 
we have to put aside, we have to put in check our opinions, our notions, and our preferences. We have to actually be what we say we are, open-minded. We can't assume that the truth that we have carried along is the truth, the way we understand it. Dr. King said at one point, use me God, show me how to take who I am and who I want to be and what I can do and use it for a purpose greater than myself. Dr. King understood we have to win another way. And I think this is the way. Let's pray. <clears throat> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us give God thanks and praise even in times such as these. God of all races, God of all nations, we praise you for all your faithful servants, for those who have done justice, for those who have loved mercy, to those who have walked humbly with their God. The John Lewis's, the Diane Nash's, the Amelia Boynton's, and Andrew Young's, the James, James Bevel's and Richie Jean Jackson's, the Viola Louison, and yes, the Martin Luther King Jr.'s. We give thanks for these and for apostles martyrs, leaders, and saints, and for humble people whose names were never in the news, but are recorded in your book of life. We give you praise for each one of these, but simultaneously, Lord, we cry out for a time when such of these are unnecessary. Dr. King talked about the arc of the moral universe as being long but bending towards justice. That, that's true, but it's, it's true because it's bent because evil twists and bows it in rebellion against your goodwill for people in your creation. We long for the day, Lord, when humankind genuinely chooses to love one another, even as you have loved us. We long for the day when there's no need to march, when there's no unequal education, unequal housing or health care. We long for the day. But until that day, Lord, we pray that you would strengthen us, that we might be just as committed, just as convicted, and just as passionate for justice and mercy as those who've gone before us. And yes, Lord God, just as humble. This is our time. Help us to inhabit it correctly. May it be said of us, as it was said of King David, that we serve the purposes of God in our own generation. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, everyone. We're going to worship in response. And the song I've picked is called Precious Lord, Take My Hand. And it's actually Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite song. And in fact, before he died, because he was murdered, he had asked that this song be played in a service that he was about to attend. And this song was a song that really meant a lot to him. And in fact, it was in the movie, if you, if you watched it. It was uh, the song that Mahalia Jackson sang to him over the phone in the middle of the night. And as we sing this, I just encourage you to really sit and think and reflect on what we learned today, what we've witnessed today. And what is your response to God? What is your heart's cry to the Lord? Precious Lord, take my 
take us into your arms would you hold us would you hear our our burning cries and would you show us the way show us step by step show us the way come and speak to us lord we are listening our ears our hearts our minds are open in jesus name amen Terrence is here and he will be sharing some words that he sensed from um, the week for you today. Okay. Morning, everyone. Um, despite what the Zoom badge says, my name is Terrence. Um, Suzanne and I are married. But yeah, yeah I'm Terrence, prayer ministry team uh, here in the church. Um, if you're new to this church, I'll mention that here in the vineyard, we value setting aside time to pray and listen closely for what's on God's heart, both at a personal level and for in our community and in the world. And we have daily prayer meetings where a bunch of us get together and do exactly this. And I I'd like to share with you some of the things that we felt God putting on our hearts uh, this past week. And if any of these resonate with what God's doing in your life, 
and you'd like some of us from the team to pray with you over Zoom, feel free to email us at prayer at pavineyard.org. Or if you'd like to join one of our daily prayer meetings, uh, you can learn about them at pavineyard.org forward slash church life forward slash here. And church life is one word. So anyway, to dive into some of the things that we sensed from God this week as we prayed. First, uh, Jeremiah 29, 13 came to mind for someone as they prayed. Where, um, where God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So there was a sense of someone who might be seeking and a sense of them finding God. But um, if there are questions that arise for you on what it means to seek God with all your heart and what it means to find God or experience God in your specific life circumstances, uh, feel free to reach out about getting prayer if any of those questions resonate with you. There was also a picture someone got of all of our problems packed into a huge jar. But to God, that huge jar looked small because God is so big. And that was a significant change of perspective. And in hearing this word, I don't think there was a sense of God minimizing our problems, but that he sees and knows all of them, our problems and the issues of the world. He has compassion for all of them and has the power to paradoxically work out pain and evil for good. And the picture of these jars with all our problems uh, calls to mind Psalm 56 verses eight to nine, where it's written about God. You, God, keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. My enemies will retreat when I call to you for help. For this I know, that God is for me. And lastly, um, there was an interesting theme across multiple prayer meetings this week of God doing some shaking, uh, refining, and cleansing of his people during these difficult times. Someone received Hebrews 12, 26 through 28 about the removing of what can be shaken, that is, uh, removing and shaking of created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. So there's a sense of a shaking and of what is eternal is what's left standing. Another person saw a picture of Noah and his family floating on water in the ark for many months. And God was somehow using that time to cleanse them. In the same way, God is using suffering to cleanse the righteous right now. But with that, there's also a reminder of a word that we received the other week that we are in life rafts as opposed to a big ship like an ark with the ability to reach little inlets and coves to help rescue others in need and pull them onto the rafts as well. And finally, there were some specific pictures received that were relevant to, uh, to us here in California. There was a picture of a green plant growing out of ashes, and also of a redwood tree that scorched and appears dead, but is actually alive after all the burning, with golden sap coming out of a big slash in the tree. And there was a sense that we need to let our scars show to those who do not know Jesus, and to be real and to let them see our brokenness. And there was also a sense that there is hope for California, and that new trees are formed from the seeds of burnt trees. So again, if any of these resonate with you, feel free to reach out to us or join us in prayer. And with that, I think I'll hand it over to Susan to close us in prayer. Thanks. Amen, amen. I received some of those words. Those, some of those things were for me. Um, and again, if you, uh, friends, if you realize like those messages are from God to you, then I encourage you to get prayer to pray and respond to God. Okay, friends, we're at the end of our service and I would like to give us a special gift of just a few minutes, seconds of silence to ask the Lord to speak to us how he wants to respond to him today. Brothers and sisters, may you be blessed by the Spirit of God, who doesn't just exist, but dwells with us and comes into our very real lives. Go in the presence 
and reality and truth of God. Amen. If you would like to come to the post church discussion group, I think that there's a link that's going to um, appear in the chat. And um, that's it for today. Have a great rest of the day. Maybe I'll just sing while you all sign off. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me Grab the link now, just click on it, leave this meeting, go to the next one. We'll see you next week and we'll end the meeting. Three, two, one, bye.